Hello and welcome from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, where we've just discovered who has received the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Joining me to discuss this is Professor Runa Tofgård, Professor of Environmental Toxicology at the Karolinska Institute. Professor Tofgård, thank you very much for joining us so soon after the, the prize has been announced. Could we begin by you telling us who has received the 2009 Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine? So the laureates are Elizabeth Blackburn from the University of uh, California, San Francisco. It's Carol Grader uh, working at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and Jack Shostak from the Harvard Medical School. And so what have they received the prize for? So they've been awarded a prize for the discovery of uh, telomeres and the enzyme telomerase and how it protects the chromosomes. And so for people who haven't heard of telomeres and telomerase before, could you explain it for them in simple terms, please? So I would say that um, our genes are encoded by DNA, and the DNA is present in the chromosomes in the cell nucleus. And the telomeres, they are the ends of the chromosomes, and they have an important function to uh, protect the chromosomes and maintain the integrity of the chromosomes. And so what would happen if they weren't protected, if the chromosomes weren't protected by these protective caps known as telomeres? So then the chromosomes would get shorter with every cell division, and in the end that would lead to loss of genetic information, but it would also mean that the chromosomes will be degraded and that will start the degradation process in our cells and eventually lead to cell death. So it has profound implications for, for cells and organisms as a whole. What sort of roles, what sort of implications for the organism does shortening of telomeres have in terms of normal cell function and disease? So it's evident that this is a fundamental biological mechanism and mutations in the telomerase genes have actually been detected in a certain group of inherited diseases. Uh, and they are characterized by difficulty to maintain stem cells, uh, particularly in the bone marrow. So if you have too little telomerase activity, uh, the uh, stem cells in the bone marrow are at risk and uh, some of these patients de develop severe anemia. So we, we, we know about this implication in disease and we know in cell function, but the story in which we discovered the role of telomeres and how telomerase is important in maintaining telomere length is a, a story that's told in several chapters. And I wonder if we could go through each of those chapters in turn to discover how we went from, from, from the beginning to what we know now. And so the, the story starts before the discoveries were made that were being rewarded with a no, with Nobel Prize in medicine. And I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what we knew about how DNA is copied in the first place. Yes, so uh, what was known in the, up in the 70s was that DNA is copied by DNA polymerases. And uh, this is a rather complicated process uh, when both strands of a DNA thread has to be copied. Uh, and it proceeds smoothly in one direction, but in the other direction it is a stepwise process. And the problem is that when it reaches the end on one of the strands, it's not possible to copy uh, the very end of the chromosome and uh, scientists didn't know how this could occur and how this could take place and and many different theories uh, were around to explain it but in fact nobody knew. So um, people knew about a mechanism of copying DNA but what, what the missing piece was how how DNA at the very ends is copied. Yes and it was also known that that was very important uh, for uh, to keep cell happy and alive. And so then we reach the first chapter of the, the telomere and telomerase story. And could you talk us through the first steps and the key experiments that, that were performed to, to, that revealed the existence of telomeres? Yeah, so, um, in fact, it was that Bl Elizabeth Blackburn were studied, uh, studying some uh, certain specific types of chromosomes in a single cell organism, uh, Tetrahymena thermophila, uh, which, um, which then, uh, which has um, these chromosomes and she discovered uh, and found that they had a specific sequence at the end. Uh, although she was at that time uh, also interested in understanding how uh, these chromosomes were maintained. Now Jack Shostak, he had a different problem. He was wanting to make artificial mini chromosomes and put them into yeast. And uh, when he made such 
uh, he discovered that if they were linear um, and they could not be maintained in yeast cells, they were rapidly degraded. So what, what was happening was that um, there was a piece of DNA that was being discovered at the end of chromosomes which was repeated many different times. And this was occurring in, a, in an organism that's, that lives in water, which is very distant from the human body. And another person, Jack Shostak, was working on yeast, and he was trying to work out why the chromosomes he was introducing into yeast were degrading. Mm. So then we reached the next part of the story, which yeah. is the key experiment. Mm. Could you talk us through that, please? Mm. Yeah, so, so as in all good science, there are lucky moments. And then one of these uh, lucky moments was when Elizabeth Blackburn and Jack Shostak met at a conference in 1980, and they heard then about each other's results. And then they decided to test uh, the possibility that the uh, end sequences from the tetrahymena could actually function in a very different species yeast, which in, in evolutionary terms is far away from each other. Yes. And, and, and so and what happened? Yeah, so then they made minochromosomes uh, just like the one that Jack Shostak had made before, but now they put tetrahymena telomer DNA at both ends, and when they introduced these uh, mini chromosomes now into yeast cells. Now they could be maintained uh, for a long periods of time and in an intact manner. And so it's quite incredible that the, the experiment worked because you have two totally different organisms taking a protected cap from one organism and attaching it to another it seemed to work fine. Yes, and I think that was the, uh, one of the mo most important aspects of the experiment because that immediately said that this must be a very strongly conserved and fundamental mechanism that was discovered. And so the next chapter of the story involves discovering how these telomeres are made in the first place. And could you talk us through that, please? Yes, so th the hypothesis was then that there might be a new and unknown enzyme that was involved in actually adding DNA sequences to the telomere ends. And Carol Grader uh, and Elizabeth Blackburn started a search for the enzyme. And so they uh, used tetrahymena cell extracts, added DNA sequences corresponding to the telomere DNA and building blocks for DNA. And uh, then they could actually analyze if an extension took place. And uh, again, on a Christmas day, 1984, uh, Carol Grady could actually detect the first signs of uh, enzyme activity in her extracts. And that was then the starting point to go on. So it's, it's a del delightful Christmas present. But what exactly is the machinery that creates telomeres? So it turns out that this is a unique enzyme that has a protein component that um, actually has a, a catalytic function and it has an RNA component that is intrinsic to the enzyme that serves as the guide or the template to determine which uh, building blocks that should be added and in which order. So the RNA acts as the, the template for construction and the enzyme that's uh, past the complex is the machinery that creates the DNA strands. Yes, these two components are actually sufficient to uh, make the reaction work in vitro. Now, now later on we know that in, in, in real cells there are also many other components that are involved and, and are surrounding these key components that we are talking about here. And so we, we have this, this, this lovely finding in, in different organisms that shows that how the, the ends of chromosomes are constructed and how it protects the chromosomes from, from degradation. We then need to move to how this is important to, to the cells that are in yours and mine bodies. So what, what was the next leap of knowledge that we had to, in order to know that this is the case? Well, s since there was uh, early observations that also said that if uh, telomerase activity was compromised, then cells would actually age or senesce in culture. So it was thought that maybe this is a key uh, mechanism to aging. However, now we know that aging at the organismal level is a much more complex process and there are many factors that influence uh, aging and uh, telomere length and telomerase is one that is important but there are many others. Now the other key thing that also came quite early was the discovery that um, most cancer cells have very high telomerase activity uh, and that is needed uh, since cancer cells proliferate very frequently and in one sense can be said to have eternal life. Um, and at the same time, uh, cancer cells also have abnormal telomeres. So that has raised hope um, that one may be able to develop new therapeutic strategies to treat cancer based on blocking telomerase activity or to uh, eliminate cells that have high telomerase activity. 
Again, one must be careful also with potential side effects since it's also now known that stem cells have uh, telomerase activity and that that activity is important for the maintenance of the stem cell compartment. So where are we with regards to understanding the role of targeting telomerase as, as a potential therapy? So early clinical trials uh, are ongoing um, in, cancer, in the cancer area, primarily with two approaches. Uh, the one approach is to block telomerase activity and the other one is actually to try to teach the immune system to eliminate cells which have high uh, telomerase activity. And I think uh, there is one phase three study but most of the other studies are phase one or phase two, and so we still have to wait until we get conclusive results and know if this will be um, uh, have efficacy towards cancer or not. So, the, going back to the discoveries that, that have been rewarded with the Nobel Prize this year, these were made in the late 1970s and the 1980s. So is there any particular reason why the, the candidates for the prize were deemed particularly worthy this year? No, actually, so the, the first key discovery was made in 19, <coughs> 1982, uh, the second on enzymatic activity in 1985, and the RNA component in 1989. So that is the time scale. Uh, but um, uh, going through different discoveries and weigh them against others as is a lengthy process, and it must also be very evident that this is a general process, uh, and, um, and also then the Nobel Committee goes through who actually did uh, the discoveries in great detail. So there is no particular reason that it's this year, um, but now all the knowledge and all these factors that I mentioned are around and uh, they were selected to be at the top of the list this year. And one of the one things that the, the achievements highlight is the, the value of curiosity-driven research and the value of high-risk, high-reward research. And, th and that's a message that's always been told by the Nobel Prize since 1901. Is this the message that the, the medicine committee is keen to promote more than ever? I think that with the Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine, we are very careful to select uh, discoveries which are of fundamental importance in biology, but also have clear implications. But it is the fact that if you discover a new fundamental biological mechanism, it's bound to have uh, also medical implication. And this is the case also with the discovery of telomerase. And another important factor is that also curiosity-driven research also in organisms that may seem far away from human beings turn out to be very important. In this case, uh, a unicellular organism, a ciliate, and yeast, but they were enough to reveal such a fundamental biological process that has all the importance also in human beings. And that's a great message to end on, uh, Professor Hofgaard. Thank you very much. For more information on, on this year's Nobel Prize Physiology and Medicine, please visit nobelprize.org, where you can see the official information about the prize, but also exclusive interviews with the new laureates as they appear on the website. That's about it for this webcast. Join us tomorrow where we'll discover who will be receiving the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics. The announcement is scheduled for 11.45 Central European time. But until then, it's goodbye from all of us at nobelprize.org.